Since the early 1900s, millions of people have flocked to amusement parks in search of food, fun, and thrills. Tills and spills take the form of wet rides, dry rides, what park enthusiasts fondly refer to as spin and barf rides, and the king of all rides. You got your entertainment, you got your merchandise, you got your great foods, but roller coasters are ultimately what everybody comes. They want that thrill and they need that thrill, and roller coasters give everybody that ultimate experience that they're looking for when they come to an amusement park. Roller coasters have become so popular that amusement industry experts say right now we're experiencing a roller coaster renaissance. There are more than 2,000 roller coasters operating around the world. And 60 new ones are slated to open this year. The basic thrill of a roller coaster is never going to go away. We're seeing more and more pop up every day throughout the country. And given the fact that roller coasters have been around since the early 1900s, my parents, their parents, and even their parents have kind of passed along that tradition to the younger set. And you're not going to find a safer yet more adrenaline-filled experience than a roller coaster. What is a roller coaster? Stripping it down to its basics, a roller coaster has a car that has wheels or coasters that roll along a track. Thus, the name roller coaster. There are two main types of coasters, wooden and steel. Coasters are then subcategorized by vehicle, track configuration, height, and propulsion or launching system. There are kiddie coasters, junior coasters, and world-class mega coasters. While the world of coasters is rich and varied, its riders are divided into two groups. There are your ordinary riders who maybe ride one to three coasters a year. And then there are the extraordinary coaster enthusiasts. Gary Nichols, coaster enthusiast, uh, ridden a few hundred coasters. When I grow up, I want to at least ride one million coasters. I have ridden one wooden roller coaster 393 times. <laughs> it's like an addiction. You, ha you have to ride. You have to get out and ride that new coaster. You, you have to get out and ride this year. I could. I would go on every single roller coaster in the world. I'm always searching for the bigger and the better coaster. More speed, more inversion. The whole feeling, the excitement, the thrill. The adrenaline rush. I love the wind in my hair. I love to be able to scream. Where else can you go and scream your head off and act like a maniac or a little kid and no one will look twice at you? What else differentiates a coaster enthusiast from your ordinary park guest? I think there's maybe a natural predisposition to it. I think you are born with that genetic predisposition. They push the envelope. They try to see what's on the other side. Take, for example, Alyssa White. I'm a roller coaster enthusiast, and I've been on over 270 different roller coasters. Alyssa frequently hits amusement parks in her home state of Florida, but she also travels around the country in search of coaster thrills. I've got tons of season passes. These are all the ones from just this year. I've got everything from pamphlets about different parks to coaster news, magazines, coaster video games, movies, books. I've got it all. I get all the updates and online gossip right here. You'll love it. Don't worry. Alyssa has asked her college buddy Ian to join her in making a 2,000-mile journey to Southern California to check out some of the latest, greatest roller coasters. The first park I'm going to take you to is Knott's Berry Farm. Now, your first coaster there will be Jaguar. It's a nice little warm-up family ride.
I'm more like your average amusement park goer. I just enjoy going to the amusement park, going on all the rides, like maybe just one time. Then there's Montezuma. This one will launch you to 55 miles per hour through a really intense loop. When Alyssa first invited me to go on this challenge of hers, my first reaction was, what kind of roller coasters do you want me to ride here? I mean, he's never been on a roller coaster over 200 feet tall. He's never been on a roller coaster that goes more than 60 miles an hour. It's going to be a lot of firsts, but he's going to have a lot of fun. I'm really, I, I can deal with some roller coasters, but others, I just, I, I won't even go near. I haven't quite told Ian just how intense some of the rides are. <laughs> The best part about knots, though, is ghost riding. Now, this is a huge wooden roller coaster with plenty of air time. Alyssa and Ian have agreed to let us crash their roller coaster road trip to help us discover the science and thrills of these rides. During their adventure, we'll find out what makes roller coasters so popular and what makes them work. The pair will also help us conduct some scientific experiments to reveal the biophysical effects these scream machines have on our human bodies. Welcome to California. The first park on Alyssa and Ian's hit list, Knott's Berry Farm in Buena Park. It's home to six roller coasters. Knott's Berry Farm is a good place to start the trip. They've got Jaguar, which is a great family roller coaster. Doesn't go too fast, doesn't go too high, and it'll be a really good place to start Ian on home. When I ride roller coasters, I do wonder as we're going through the course, you know, how do the designers make these cars stay on the track? How do they know that when they go down the first hill that this car is going to stay attached to the track? Ian's fear is quite common. But if we look under the coaster car, we'll find several sets of the now standard three-wheel configuration. One wheel runs along the top of the track. The second is a guide wheel running along the side, and the third wheel on the bottom keeps the car from flying up off the track. This ingenious three-wheel design was engineered by American coaster maker John Miller, who patented several coaster safety mechanisms in the 1920s. Since then, roller coasters, be they wooden or steel, have followed this three-wheel configuration. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that scary or anything. It was a really nice way to see the park. It was exciting. Next up, Montezuma's Revenge. It's a shuttle coaster, meaning that riders shuttle back and forth through the station instead of traveling a full circular course. You don't go up a big hill, but then all of a sudden you're just launched really fast. Montezuma blasts riders from 0 to 55 miles per hour in 5 seconds. It employs the same catapult principle that aircraft carriers use to dispatch planes into the air. Its flywheel drive mechanism is operated by a bob cable which connects to the cars. The clutch on the flywheel mechanism engages the bob cable and catapults riders forward into the 360-degree loop and 140-foot tower. This is just one way that coasters today launch from the station. Traditionally, when coaster trains are released, their 2,000-pound weight rolls them toward the bottom of the first hill. A safety chain dog 
located underneath the train, attaches to the chain, so the chain can pull the coaster car up the hill. If the chain should break, an anti-rollback device stops the train. An anti-rollback uh, typically is just like a, a giant ratchet ladder. It's got teeth that go all the way from the bottom of the lift to the top. And basically, a little ratchet paw will basically click up the teeth. And that makes that little sound that you hear when you're going up the lift. If anything ever goes wrong, basically the car will just stop on the lift. In the last few decades, coaster makers have engineered alternative lift and propulsion systems. In 2000, Millennium Force at Cedar Point in Sandusky, Ohio, introduced the world's first cable elevator lift system. It's quick, smooth, and very quiet. That same year, Hypersonic at Paramount's King's Dominion in Doswell, Virginia, opened the first air launch coaster. It uses compressed air to rocket riders from zero to 80 miles per hour in less than two seconds. And the park's volcano coaster has a linear induction launch system. It uses magnets placed on the ride vehicles and currents of electricity along its track to jettison riders forward and blast them out of the top of the volcano. <laughs> Boomerang thrills riders by pulling them backwards up 11 stories. Okay, you ready? No. Okay. Oh! Then it drops them at 50 miles per hour into two corkscrew turns and a vertical loop. <laughs> riders are then treated to another 11 story tower where the whole trip begins again. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Here we go. Woo! Here we go. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of keys there. Roller coasters have obviously come a long way since their humble origins in 15th century Russia. Russian ice slides evolved into elaborate wooden slides that the French then adapted in the 1800s. This amusement featured cars with wheels. They reached speeds of 30 miles per hour, although engineers couldn't figure out how to keep the cars on the track. Surprisingly, the ride injuries and deaths contributed to their popularity. By the late 1800s, the French had tired of this amusement but across the Atlantic, the evolution of the roller coaster took a different path and originated from the American railway system. In the 1870s, people lined up on weekends to take the Mock Chunk Railway tours in Pennsylvania. The scenic ride lasted 18 miles. Its thrill? 17 of it ran downhill. The popular amusement led to the switchback gravity pleasure railway developed by Lamarcus Thompson in 1884. People lined up three hours for the five cent ride, earning Thompson a $600 per day revenue. Proving to be an economic success, the switchback heralded the birth of the first true roller coaster built in America. The switchback operated at Coney Island in New York. The popular ocean resort in Brooklyn featured several different parks. They attracted coaster designers who built more than 30 coasters there from 1884 through the 1930s. Its most famous, the Coney Island Cyclone. It opened in 1927 and still thrills riders today at Astroland Park. What makes wooden coasters so much fun and so scary? One, wood gives. Its flexible nature helps absorb the forces of the train while contributing to its thrill appeal. This thrill formula proved so successful that by 1930, nearly 2,000 roller coasters operated across the United States. However, 
the golden age of coasters collapsed with the Great Depression and the Second World War. The struggling economy crippled the amusement park industry. The number of coasters dropped to only a couple of hundred. So with thousands of coasters in operation today, what revitalized their popularity? Steel coasters. Steel led to the development of innovative coaster designs that the public never experienced before. Steel coasters have a smoothness to them and sustained speed, very similar to the sensation of flying or soaring, as opposed to a wooden coaster where the experience is much more reckless and wild and out of control. Riding a wooden coaster is a little rougher. Like that, I like that. Wooden coasters regained their appeal thanks to a series of magnificent coasters designed by John Allen. The first in his series, the Racer, located at Paramount's Kings Island in Kings Island, Ohio. It opened in 1972, and its popularity is credited with contributing to the roller coaster boom. Then, in 1979, the park introduced the Beast. The world's longest wooden roller coaster spanning 35 acres and measuring 7,400 feet long. That's almost one and a half miles long. On the West Coast, Knott's Berry Farm's Ghost Riders construction consumed about as much lumber as the Beast, which is enough to build two or three wooden coasters in other parts of the country. That's because Ghost Rider had to meet California's earthquake construction standards. Ghost Rider has a lot of that zero-G feeling of weightlessness, and I know he doesn't like that. But it's a wooden coaster, he hasn't been on many, and he'll give it a chance. So what are you scared about on this ride? Everything after the lift. Ghost Rider, which opened in 1998, lifts riders 118 feet high. And then plunges them into a banked drop. Riders encounter 13 more drops, sudden dips, and bank turns along its 4,533-foot-long track. was actually a lot more fun than I thought it would be. The scary parts were probably the drop at first was kind of scary with all the wood rushing over your head and then there were a few of the little hills that you come over where the wood looks like it's going to come really close to hitting you. Coaster enthusiasts call these elements head choppers. They're overhead structural beams that appear deceivingly low or close to your head as you race under them. Next, we're going to go to Six Flags Magic Mountain, which really is the extreme park. A lot more big roller coasters for Ian to ride, and we're really excited. My feelings about Six Flags right now are a little iffy. I mean, I'm looking forward to some of the roller coasters, but Goliath is really just up there in my mind, and I'm not sure about that one yet. Our next location on our ultimate guide to roller coasters Six Flags Magic Mountain, located in Valencia, California. This extreme park has 15 roller coasters. Enough variety for people of all ages to ride, even the little ones. Our smaller guests see things they want to do. They might not be tall enough or old enough, but they walk into an area like Bugs Bunny World where they see right away it's something that's at their comfort level. They get weaned on the experience, and then they know when they get older and taller that they can come back and ride bigger Six Flags attractions. Which raises several questions. Are we born with a need to experience thrills, or do we acquire this? What forces are exerted on our bodies? How do roller coasters stimulate our senses? brains and stomachs. 
Why do coasters elicit terror in some riders? And smiles and laughter in others? To find out, let's join Ian and Alyssa as they ride Superman. Superman the Escape. It flies riders from zero to 100 miles per hour in seven seconds, lifting them straight up a 410-foot tall tower. The weightless feeling experienced aboard Superman on the way down lasts six seconds. It's pure free fall. This is also called zero-g time by coaster enthusiasts, or airtime. On other coasters, it's experienced when riders crest the top of the hill and float out of their seats. Zero-g means they are experiencing zero forces of gravity or zero times their body weight. Yeah, nice. Are such thrill sensations harmful to our bodies? Medical doctors believe not. The thrill is good for you, because if a cell doesn't become stressed, how will it ever adapt to stay strong? You know, things need to be stressed, things need to be conditioned. That keeps us young, that keeps us, you know, tuned, that keeps us strong. It's, it's a form of therapy. We like to be scared, and we like to have fun, and we like to do things that Take us to the edge while at the same time we know that we're completely safe and nothing's going to happen to us. And roller coasters provide a way to go extremely fast, extremely high. You can do turns, you can do flips, you can fly, you can spin. All of these things that you just simply cannot do in, in other forms of recreation, you can do on a roller coaster. <laughs> I love the six seconds of weightlessness. That's, that's the part I just I couldn't stomach. It just made me feel so queasy. I could ride Superman a million times. Let's go ride again. No way. OK, we'll go to Batman. Some people just want to do it once, and that's it. They no longer need to have the hormonal rush because their body's neurochemicals may say, that's enough. Been there, done that, check. Some people have a lower threshold. Some people need more stimulus to get to that level. Batman's a really fast, intense ride, but I could stay on it all day. Batman. A steel coaster that twists and turns riders upside down on ski lift like seats. This one's cool because, like, the track's above you, nothing below you, your feet just dangle. You see the whole park from up here. Wow, this is going to be great. Yes. Yeah. All right, here we go. We're at the top. Motion sickness occurs when your eyes and the balance mechanisms of the inner ear send your brain conflicting signals. With the fluid in your inner ear dependent upon gravity and head position for balance, when you flip and twist upside down, the fluid sloshes around. In response to this erratic fluid movement, nausea can occur and lead to the unpleasant purging of the stomach. We know that as we get older, the little hairs in the ear become stiffer. The fluid in the middle ear becomes also thicker, doesn't flow as well. So we can become disoriented quicker. And that alone signals that it has to do with the nervous system being the inner ear or the brain itself. You ready to get off? I think I might be. When I'm riding Batman, the whole reason I like it so much is all the turns. But that's also the reason why I don't think I could ride it a lot, because it's, it's so intense that I just started to feel a little sick after riding it. Next, Ian and Alyssa ride Goliath. Goliath, a top-rated steel coaster, reaches 240 feet into the air and drops 255 feet at 85 miles per hour. The anticipation is the key. Thinking about the roller coaster, thinking about the height, causes their heart to palpitate, palms to sweat. So the brain is a pretty uh, delicate organ that will be turned on immediately by the senses. To discover how coasters affect our heart rates, Ian and Alyssa agree to help us conduct some onboard science experiments. Three teams of heart monitoring experts apply sensors to their bodies. This will 
will measure changes in heart rate to help us understand what happens to our bodies when we ride roller coasters. This is the heart rate. The instantaneous heart rate is, in this case, is around 54. And at this point right now, he's in a very relaxed physiologic state, which he won't be very soon. <laughs> your eyes because you do not want to see something is a protective mechanism like we all blink and we all want to keep our eyes closed and thinking that that make the evil go away you know which is sort of uh, illogical if you think about it but you know it's an illogical situation because you're in a safe environment because you're only sitting in a chair going down a track well vocalization you think about it is a primitive response because it to to yell for your offenders or for your for your tribesmen to come help you against another tribe i'm sure you know the one with the loudest voice gets more help Okay, we're halfway done. Now we're gonna go into the helix. Uh, 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 uh. When someone has a, a fear, the body goes and goes into action. It's an all or nothing response. Once you turn on the uh, the alarm system, right away the blood circulates and immediately it carries. Uh, adrenaline that signals the brain to start releasing growth hormone. It's all of a sudden insulin is released. Insulin is then released, making more sugar available. The sympathetic nervous system is turned on, causing you know whiter, you know eyes, skin, you know taut. The purpose of every organ system we have in our body is to keep the brain alive, to keep our perception, you know, uh, up, to keep us alert. One more turn and we're there. Oh! Let's take a look at the results of the tests. I basically decided, what would we look at? I picked circulation. I said, we're, we're going to use what's called the BioZ. It's a NASA technology that non-invasively and non-destructively measures the blood flow uh, to the heart. It measures the resistance of blood flow in the body. And it's going to give us an image of what's going on as you go through the high G forces and how the body tries to keep you awake and alert and, and protect you from that stress. What we saw was, number one, blood pressures in both of our riders were, were markedly elevated for their baseline. We probably expect his pressure to be uh, resting, to be somewhere around 120 over 70. And what he's got here is 162 over 95, markedly elevated for a guy who's 21 years old. I was so nervous going up that hill. All I had to think about was, that at some point, I'm going up this big hill. I got to come down eventually. At the top of the hill here, we're going to see him look at his facial expressions. He's getting angry. He's, he's starting to uh, wonder, why is he doing this for his friend? Anger and other emotions raise the heart rate quite a bit. I think he was pretty angry at me at that point for taking him on the ride. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's about right. <laughs> Second, I said, well, I need a device to monitor uh, heart rate itself, just to look at heart rate. We put the monitors on and we were able to see some very interesting uh, results. What we found was that resting, basically, uh, Ian and uh, Alyssa both had heart rates around 72 to 80. And then we get to the bottom of the first hill. In 11 seconds, Ian's heart rate went from 86 up to 150, which is very fast. And likewise, Alyssa went from 89 up to 140. The peak heart rate at one particular time for Ian was up to 147. I was scared to death. <laughs> at the uh, bottom of the second hill, he had slowed down to 96. He had so somewhat adapted to the ride. And by the end of the ride, they were back down to about 80, which in her case was fairly close to normal. But in his case, he still hadn't gotten all the way to his relaxation phase. Yeah, I can understand being excited after the ride. I mean, it takes some time to, you know, come down from your high, especially when you're 255 feet high. It didn't hurt or anything. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd do it again anytime soon, but it, I did feel much better about myself after doing it. Our ultimate guide leads us to the ultimate coaster on Alyssa and Ian's list, X. I think X looks pretty out of this world, but it's really a lot of fun. Coming into it, I had no idea what to expect. It just it looked so weird. All right, Ian, we're here on X, which is the most extreme ride in the park. Certainly. How do you feel? I don't know how to feel. 
video. It looks really weird. X is really a glimpse into the future. It's a prototype thrill ride where we've taken the seats and placed them on the outside of the coaster track, which allows us to spin riders 360 degrees forwards and backwards all throughout the entire length of the coaster track. Honestly, in looking back, I couldn't tell you what parts I liked just because I never knew what part I was on. I just liked whenever you fell, it looked like there was nothing underneath you except for just empty space. Uh. Woo! You did it! That was a lot of fun. So we're going to go again? Sure, why not? How about two more times? I'll think about it. <laughs> X is so unique and amazing. There's nothing else in the world like it. You're just thrown around. You have no idea where you're going. It's so unique and crazy. I wonder how they came up with it. Basically, at the age of 12, after going to the state fair and riding certain flat rides and, and things that spin and flip, it popped into my head, hey, how, how come there's not a coaster that does this as well? How come you can't spin on a coaster? X follows a long-time tradition by ride engineers of introducing the next generation coasters that will revolutionize the industry. I think we've reached a point where coasters are not necessarily getting bigger and faster, but they're getting more technologically advanced. Uh, you're seeing different types of coaster track, different types of coaster cars. Ride vehicles have dramatically changed during the last three decades. Traditional wooden and steel coasters tend to feature trains like these two-seaters made by the Philadelphia Toboggan Company. They commonly feature a lap bar and belt. But with the advent of looping coasters, over-the-shoulder restraints were designed to keep riders safely in their seats during inversions. The latest generation of non-looping steel coasters avoid the shoulder harnesses in favor of leg or lower body restraints to allow more freedom of the upper body, arms, and head. Traditional coasters have trains running on top of the track. But in 1987, Cedar Point in Sandusky, Ohio, introduced one of the world's first suspended coasters, featuring cars that hang from an overhead track. In 1992, Six Flags Great America in Illinois took that one step further by introducing the world's first inverted coaster with ski lift-like seats so riders' feet can dangle freely below as they're sent through a series of loops or inversions. The inverted coaster was created to simulate aerial maneuvers. In 1996, Cedar Point debuts one of the world's tallest and fastest stand-up coasters. Passengers stand while being turned upside down on this 145-foot, 60-mile-per-hour speed machine. In 1999, Six Flags Great Adventure in Jackson, New Jersey, debuts the world's first floorless coaster, in which riders' feet are free to dangle while they ride, seated above the track. Then, in 2002, Six Flags Magic Mountain introduces X, a coaster unlike anything that preceded it. Its seats are positioned to the side of the track. How are innovative coasters like these designed and engineered? For instance, how do designers power a coaster? Unlike automobiles, what fuels a traditional coaster isn't gasoline or a motor. Its kinetic energy comes from the height of that first hill. At that point, at the top of that chain lift hill, um, every outside force stops. From that point on, gravity is the only thing that helps you, and it will bring the car through all the dips and hills and loops and bring it back into the station. Everything is controlled by gravity. Slowing down the trains are the loops, twists, turns, and hills. Ride engineers use computerized calculations to tell them how many elements they can put into the ride and the length of the track. They don't want too many or too much because they want to make sure the train has enough energy to return to the station. 
While these elements are physical in nature, they also add thrills that are so important to making a great coaster ride experience. Going down the drop, it's always a good throw. The first drop on a roller coaster would be the best because it's normally where all the hype is. And that's normally where your most top speed is. Um, I like the speed and how it makes you go upside down. I like going upside down. I like the turning around. Coaster makers engineer these elements into the rides knowing exactly how much counterforce each of these elements exerts on the trains and our bodies. Typically all coaster design limits are based on the human body, the g-forces that you can take. If you weigh 100 pounds, while going around a 3G turn, you will feel 300 pounds of weight. Typically, the highest uh, positive Gs would be, you know, at the bottom of a drop and a pullout. So your, your coaster's heading straight towards the ground. It's got to come up, and so you experience a lot of positive Gs into your seat to get that coaster to come up. When you're cresting over the top of a hill, that's when the, the coaster's turning over. Basically, your body still wants to go up, and so that's where you would experience either zero Gs or even negative Gs a little bit. I mean, certainly, that uh, is one of the scariest things on a coaster and, and one of the most important. <laughs> Lateral Gs um, is basically what you feel from side to side. The only place you would really experience lateral Gs is in a corner. Now, almost all coasters have a lot of corners, so um, if you bank the ride, you can basically take the lateral Gs away. But uh, it's not always necessary and not always advantageous. Sometimes you want to give the people a little thrill by leaving the corner a little flatter and having them kind of feel their body that wants to go around and around the corner. It gives them a little more experience that the coaster's a little more out of control. How do designers engineer such G's into their rides? Our speeds are calculated from the layout profile. This top graph shows the speeds of the ride, and the bottom graph shows the G-forces. And all of this information is taken so we know how to properly bank the ride, and we also know that we're not going beyond our limits of G-forces for this ride. The end result can vary according to the coaster's track configuration. Tracks can follow any one of a number of basic patterns. The traditional out and back coaster has a track that circles out and comes back. It delivers thrills with dips, hills, and turns. The twister has tighter turns and helixes, many of them banked with a twisted track configuration that twists in and out of itself. The double out and back, in which a coaster goes out and back twice before ending. The out and back twister hybrid, where the coaster track goes out and back and has elements where it twists over and under and around itself. The out and back with a helix or double helix ending, meaning it has a traditional out and back configuration, but ends with a 360 degree turn or helix or a double helix, meaning it has two helixes at the end. Then there is the racing coaster, which features two competing tracks and trains that are supposed to be timed so that the heavier coaster will win. Its tracks can either go out and back or twist, or both. The dueling coaster has two competing trains fly by and race toward each other through a twisted course. Then there's the dueling racing coaster, which has two trains start off at the same time and then go into a series of dueling and racing elements until they both reach the finish line. Once the final design is decided upon and complete, coaster designers then turn their designs over to structural engineers who produce specifications for manufacturing and construction. An average coaster takes six to nine months to complete. Coaster makers break in the trains by adding weight to the cars and sending it around the course several times. Then they test the ride to make sure that the final speed and G-forces comply with their designs. 
Uh, we see the speed profile right here, but it, we need to correct that uh, based on the reflectors that we've placed out. We'll crunch the numbers and we'll let you know how fast it's going soon. Good. Ride makers then hand the ride over to the park. It's now up to the park to maintain and inspect the ride on a daily basis before the park opens. This inspection is greatly responsible for what's called the smoothness of the ride experience. So any area of the track that may seem slightly out of alignment or that may impair the ride experience is attended to and corrected during maintenance. Trains are also inspected and repaired by teams after hours. During the winter or off-season months, trains are totally torn apart and then rebuilt to ensure the safety of their parts. Maintenance crews and ride operators test run the trains every morning to check the system and listen for unusual sounds. Control tests include an emergency stop mid-ride to make sure the safety systems are in operation. Modern day coasters utilize a central computerized ride control system. The brains of the coaster. It automatically monitors where the trains are and will shut the ride down if it senses a potential problem. Classic coasters like the Coney Island Cyclone utilize manual operating systems that release and break the train in the station. Modern day coasters rely on pneumatic braking systems to stop the trains. Underneath the coaster trains are brake fins. The braking pads located along the track are automatically triggered by the computerized ride operation system to clamp down on the brake fins and stop the trains at the end of the run. Trim brakes are sometimes placed in some parts of the ride to slow the ride down in case the computer notices there is too much weight in the train. Magnetic brakes were devised in the 1990s. Magnets placed under the trains react negatively to specially fabricated metal at the end of the run to smoothly stop a train from 60 to 0 miles per hour in less than 6 seconds. Now that you know how coasters are designed and operated, what are some of the ways to ride a coaster? Coaster enthusiasts offer these tips. Usually the best time to ride a coaster, most people would say, is later in the day, once it's had a chance to warm up and break in. However, personally, I love riding at night. I like riding in the rain on a coaster because of, you get the effect of sticking your head out the window in the rain and, and like when you're driving in a car. Yeah, this is cool. The view obviously would be the best aspect of riding the front of a roller coaster. You know, you get to see everything before anybody else. I like the back. You get the more of the uh, acceleration. You feel a lot more G-forces in the back. The best way to ride a coaster is often. Like Alyssa and Ian search for the latest, greatest coaster, the story of the roller coaster is far from over. With the tools and technology ride engineers have at their disposal today, how tall and fast could a coaster go? I really don't think there is a limit on coasters. Certainly, there's always the limit of space and, and cost. Other than that, you can easily imagine a coaster being as tall as the tallest building. We can certainly build coasters as tall as anybody wants. And the more they find out that there is no limit, the, the more they're going to want it. This incredible scream machine has been around for more than a century due to its popular appeal. As humans continue to seek engineered thrills that simulate the sensations of flight and freedom, the roller coaster will continue to develop and evolve. And we have now the second golden age of the roller coaster. Typically, over the last 10 years, I've called it the coaster arms race, basically, as in terms of height and speed. So coming up with the best coaster certainly is about the most, you know, competitive aspect of it. So you can either go two fronts. You can go, you know, height and speed, or you can go something totally unique. Either of those add experience to the coaster that uh, separate it from others. Experts believe roller coasters will take even more shocking, thrilling, and surprising forms in the years to come. 
The future is limitless, and at this point, for us, everything's top secret, but you're going to see a lot of fun stuff coming out. How fast something will go, how much technology will be developed, it's a matter of imagination and money. You're seeing designers and engineers and different manufacturers putting different elements into their rides. They're using different launch systems. I don't know if you have to go super mega height. I think you've got to go for the experience. Give that thrill of on the edge of your seat, speed, and fun. Since the early 1900s, millions of people have flocked to amusement parks in search of food, fun, and thrills. Tills and spills take the form of wet rides, dry rides, what park enthusiasts fondly refer to as spin and barf rides, and the king of all rides. You got your entertainment, you got your merchandise, you got your great foods, but roller coasters are ultimately what everybody comes. They want that thrill and they need that thrill, and roller coasters give everybody that ultimate experience that they're looking for when they come to an amusement park. Roller coasters have become so popular that amusement industry experts say right now we're experiencing a roller coaster renaissance. There are more than 2,000 roller coasters operating around the world. And 60 new ones are slated to open this year. The basic thrill of a roller coaster is never going to go away. We're seeing more and more pop up every day throughout the country. And given the fact that roller coasters have been around since the early 1900s, my parents, their parents, and even their parents have kind of passed along that tradition to the younger set. And you're not going to find a safer yet more adrenaline-filled experience than a roller coaster. This ingenious three-wheel design was engineered by American coaster maker John Miller, who patented several coaster safety mechanisms in the 1920s. Since then, roller coasters, be they wooden or steel, have followed this three-wheel configuration. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that scary or anything. It was a really nice way to see the park. It was exciting. Next up, Montezuma's Revenge. It's a shuttle coaster, meaning that riders shuttle back and forth through the station instead of traveling a full circular course. Montezuma's Revenge is really good. You start in the station and you don't go up a big hill, but then all of a sudden you're just launched really fast. Montezuma blasts riders from 0 to 55 miles per hour in five seconds. It employs the same catapult principle that aircraft carriers use to dispatch planes into the air. It's flywheel drive mech enthusiast from your ordinary park guest. I think there's maybe a natural predisposition to it. I think you are born with that genetic predisposition. They push the envelope. They try to see what's on the other side. Take, for example, Alyssa White. I'm a roller coaster enthusiast, and I've been on over 270 different roller coasters. 
Alyssa frequently hits amusement parks in her home state of Florida, but she also travels around the country in search of coaster thrills. I've got tons of season passes. These are all the ones from just this year. I've got everything from pamphlets about different parks to coaster news, magazines, coaster video games, movies, books. I've got it all. I get all the updates and online gossip right here. You'll love it. Don't worry. Alyssa has asked her college buddy Ian to join her in making a 2,000-mile journey to Southern California to check out some of the latest, greatest roller coasters. The first park I'm going to take you to is Knott's Berry Farm. Now, your first coaster there will be Jaguar. It's a nice little warm-up family ride. I'm more like your average amusement park goer. I just enjoy going to the amusement park, going on all the rides, like maybe just one time. Then there's Montezuma. This one will launch you to 55 miles per hour through a really intense loop. When Alyssa first invited me to go on this challenge of hers, my first reaction was, what kind of roller coaster do you want me to ride here? I mean, he's never been on a roller coaster over 200 feet tall. He's never been on a roller coaster that goes more than 60 miles an hour. It's going to be a lot of firsts, but he's going to have a lot of fun. I'm really, I, I can deal with some roller coasters, but others, I just, I, I won't even go near. I haven't quite told Ian just how intense some of the rides are. <laughs> the best part about Knott's, though, is ghost riding. Now, this is a huge wooden roller coaster with plenty of air time. Alyssa and Ian have agreed to let us crash their roller coaster road trip to help us discover the science and thrills of these rides. During their adventure, we'll find out what makes roller coasters so popular and what makes them work. The pair will also help us conduct some scientific experiments to reveal the biophysical effects these scream machines have on our human bodies. Welcome to California. The first park on Alyssa and Ian's hit list, Knott's Berry Farm in Buena Park. It's home to six roller coasters. Knott's Berry Farm is a good place to start the trip. They've got Jaguar, which is a great family roller coaster. Doesn't go too fast, doesn't go too high, and it'll be a really good place to start Ian off. <laughs> When I ride roller coasters, I do wonder as we're going through the course, you know, how do the designers make these cars stay on the track? How do they know that when they go down the first hill that this car is going to stay attached to the track? Ian's fear is quite common. But if we look under the coaster car, we'll find several sets of the now standard three-wheel configuration. One wheel runs along the top of the track. The second is a guide wheel running along the side, and the third wheel on the bottom keeps the car from flying up off the track. What is a roller coaster? Stripping it down to its basics, a roller coaster has a car that has wheels or coasters that roll along a track. Thus the name, roller coaster. There are two main types of coasters, wooden, and steel. Coasters are then subcategorized by vehicle, track configuration, height, and propulsion or launching system. There are kiddie coasters, junior coasters, and world-class mega coasters. While the world of coasters is rich and varied, its riders are divided into two groups. There are your ordinary riders who maybe ride one to three coasters a year. And then there are the extraordinary coaster enthusiasts. Gary Nichols, coaster enthusiast, uh, ridden a few hundred coasters. When I grow up, I want to at least ride one million coasters. I have ridden one wooden roller coaster 393 times. <laughs> it's like an addiction. You, ha you have to ride. You have to get out and ride that new coaster. You, you have to get out and ride this year. I could. I would go on every single roller coaster in the world. I'm always searching for the bigger and the better coaster. More speed, more inversion. The whole feeling, the excitement, the thrill. The adrenaline rush. 
I love the wind in my hair. I love to be able to scream. Where else can you go and scream your head off and act like a maniac or a little kid and no one will look twice at you? What else differentiates a coaster